Hello everyone, welcome to week 9 of From the Stands College Football Game Day Show. My name is Brian, alongside me, Andy Hopper, and Tom Scavetta. He's thrown up the 9, he's done it every week. Tom, we're going to hit double digits soon, and I don't know how you're going to have to pull the feet out, because uh, we're getting close to week 10, week 11, and the end of the season here. Uh, we will jump right into our weekly recap for the season, uh, for the week I should say. Andy, I'll start with you. Uh, what were you watching this weekend? Uh, watching Illinois blow a fucking... 21-7 to lead, and then the best player on the field, uh, All-American, the best defensive tackle in the nation, the best player in that game, um, get penalized for dominating and making a play, an absolutely egregious fucking targeting call. What else do you want him to do? Uh, Johnny Newton just fucking destroyed that offensive lineman, made him look silly, um, and hit the uh, Wisconsin quarterback before he even knew it was coming. Uh, so he makes a play, he gets a sack, and the other team is awarded 30 yards on a roughing the passer call. And then, oh, let's go review it. No, it's targeting. He's out of the game. Oh, and he's got to miss the first half of, the, of their next matchup against Minnesota. Fuck the NCAA. Fuck the referees in that game. Egregious. 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 Completely turn the momentum in that game, of course, because if you take the best player off the field, yeah, it's going to change uh, what's going on. Wisconsin was having absolute fits, stopping him the whole game. But let me also let you know, Fucking Keith Randolph, his running mate, uh, in the, the uh, on the defensive line, not playing in this game as well. So you're missing your top two guys on defense, as well as all the injuries in the secondary. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's what I was watching. Fuck, fuck that. That was bullshit. Um, also, fuck Penn State. They're they suck. They're frauds. Um, UCF, shout out to them for uh, keeping up with Oklahoma. I was very impressed by uh, your Golden Knights, Ryan. And also Thank North you. Carolina, fraudulent. How do you lose? To a one in well now two and five one in five Virginia who I think their only win on the year was against William and Mary uh, at home North Carolina lost this game at home 31-27. Uh, got some questions I think need to be asked um, <laughs> in that uh, by, in that uh, coaching offices or what or what the fuck ever in that locker room too uh, and then the last one Houston giving Texas like everything they had that was a really good game as well yeah that was indeed a a good one Tom what about you um. Obviously, Ohio State over Penn State was big, 20-12. 20, 20 to 12. I had a feeling they'd win that game. They held the Nittany Lions to just 49 rushing yards, and Marvis and Harrison Jr. continues to be a highlight reel uh, this season. So that was a great game. We also saw Florida State and Duke. Uh, Duke was hanging tough, boys. They, they were um, – I think they were leading at one point in the first half. The score was tied around half. FF team back Riley Leonard did play, but he did not look 100%. Just 6-9 passing yards and one pick. Um, we saw a bit of both of their quarterbacks. FSU wins by 18. They're still undefeated. Uh, speaking of undefeated, the upset scares, Andy mentioned, Brian's UCF Knights ruining a lot of people's parlays last week. Uh, shout out to you guys, Brian. I know you don't want participation trophies. You haven't won a Big 12 game yet, but that was one heck of an effort. Uh, those those guys deserve all the credit in the world for the fight they put up against those Sooners um, and possibly knocking down their confidence a notch in their efforts to make the college football playoff. And then, of course, Utah knocking off USC. Fuck Caleb Williams. Um, done as a Heisman hopeful. Got outplayed by a former walk-on in Bryson Barnes. It's the second straight loss for USC. Maybe next time don't paint your fingernails, uh, Caleb, and I think you'll be all all right. Um, but yeah. you, well, those painted fingernails just one short year ago. USC's defense also surrendered 247 rushing yards to the Utes. The Utes are a spooky team, and they continue to somehow just bullshit their way to wins <laughs> week after week. Yes, I like you're throwing in the spooks and the scares because it is, of course, uh, our Halloween special this week, Halloween, coming up uh, very soon. Uh, yeah, you guys mentioned, I think, most of the games that everyone was watching. One that I threw in the card that I know everyone hated, and I'm sure no one watched, uh, as bad as advertised, Iowa versus Minnesota, a 12-10 to oh, stinker, uh, just horrific offenses. We all knew it was coming, but uh, like I said, it's a bit of a car crash. You can't look away. You know, like peeping through your fingers a little bit just to catch a little bit of action. Um, just <laughs> absolutely awful. Like I said, Utah, uh, two weeks in a row, my plus 200s for my parlays make me look good, and then I just get done in by my own team. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, it has to happen that way. But, yeah, I, I did like our performance against Oklahoma. That was All in all, that was a very good game uh, start to finish. So, you know, maybe Oklahoma needs to – that was that was a wake-up call they probably needed uh, as they head towards a, a possible uh, CFP moving forward. That will move us into our first segment here. It is, of course, Halloween themed. It is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Spy. That's right. We are talking about Spygate again this year coming out of Michigan. We have a Michigan staffer, Connor Stalians. Uh, he's been caught uh, buying tickets to many, many games of opponents. This is obviously against NCAA rules. I, I don't. I think it's 
partially an unwritten rule from what I understand that in the books you cannot have a staffer going to games um, but there's not really any like decided punishments but uh, w with what we're about to talk about I think it is very clear that there most likely will be a, a pretty large punishment coming down here uh, per Pete Thamel uh, if you have not heard this story yet it is evolving by the hour these last couple days Connor Stallions bought tickets to at least four different on-campus games of four CFP contenders last year 12 of 13 Big Ten teams as well uh, he's been video videotaping plays on the sidelines for Michigan. Um, I mean, like I said, I think we know punishment's coming down, but Andy, I'll start with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Th this kind of partially derails, you know, the hype behind Michigan. They might not make the playoff because of this if they, you know, take a pretty harsh punishment from the NCAA here. Yeah, I don't know. This dude fucking loves Michigan football, though. Uh, he <laughs> has been training since he was 16 years old um, for the day that he takes over uh, Michigan football, apparently a graduate of the Naval Academy and uh, did some work with the football team at Navy uh, while also helping out at Michigan on his like off days and shit, um, uh, spring break, stuff like that. Um, I just really loves Michigan football. Not only was he, so he, like, he set up a network of, of people that he would Venmo and send to these games to scout for him. Uh, he also, which is the most, the craziest part of the story is the <laughs> Michigan Manifesto. This guy has a fucking Google Drive document that he is actively working on every day that is 500 to 600 pages on the future of the Michigan program and how him and his these people that he's this group that he's put together <laughs> are going to make Michigan the class, the NCAA and, you know, the best the best team ever. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's used his connections very well. He says he's very good friends with Jay Harbaugh. <laughs> Uh, and the linebackers coach whose name I'm forgetting. But this is, yeah, I mean, this is fucked up. I mean, shocker, Michigan doing something to get ahead. I did laugh because I saw Portnoy from Barstool tweeted that uh, Connor Stallions has a standing offer to work at Barstool Sports. Um, I believe in, it was like something like incredible leader. I believe in rewarding uh, excellence, not penalizing it or, or something like that. So he's, he's in on it. Obviously, he's a big Michigan guy. But uh, no, it's not cool, man. It's shady. Um, I, I think they're going to do this whole thing where I'm sure the, the coaches are going to deny. Well, I know I never knew about any of that. I never saw any of that. I'm sure Harbaugh will be like, well, I never directed anybody to do anything. They all knew about everything. They all fucking know 100 percent. This guy is on the sidelines regularly like he works in the Michigan program. So you can't deny that he didn't work for you. He's currently suspended with pay um, unless that's been updated. But I, it's fucked up. I don't know what to say other than it's fucked up, but I also like kind of respect this. Like he might be the ultimate football guy. He just loves Michigan, dude. Like, and he didn't even go there. Apparently, he said that he had the opportunity to go to Michigan. Um, both of his parents are Michigan alums, but he also got in the Naval Academy, and he chose to go to Navy because he knew foot, there were certain football coaches with that were very good with ties to the service academies, a la Bo Schembechler and fucking Bill Belichick. So yeah, this guy is just a psychopath, and he just, he just wants he just wants to wi build a winning program. So can we really fault him for that? But yeah, no, the sign stealing is is pretty fucked up. Um, but it, it's, I mean, if this, okay. So I also said, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be done after this. They they also said what 12 out of 13 Big Ten teams. So I'm gonna assume since Illinois was good enough last year that they came that they sent somebody <laughs> to Champaign, and I should have been able to sniff that out. That, that one's on yeah. me. I got to be better as a fucking fan, and that also explains why they beat Illinois um, at the big house last year on some fucking bullshit. That was offensive pass interference. It wasn't called fucking just given Michigan free fucking first downs. Uh, but yeah, this is fucked up, but I'm not surprised. Yeah. You could have broken this thing wide open, Andy, uh, if you just had kept your eyes <laughs> <I know>. open. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I said, evolving by the hour, I wasn't aware of the manifesto part. Uh, at this, there's just so you much. You heard about that? No, no, there's so much news Dude, coming out. It's hard the, to keep look up. up. Look up the sports illustrated article on it it's a really good really good article about this dude like oh my god the michigan manifesto anybody that has any documents on their computer <laughs> with the word manifesto in the title anywhere is a fucking psychopath straight to jail for sure uh, tom what are your thoughts on this um thoughts yeah i have some thoughts um <laughs> has it 11 big 10 schools that's that's something else. I mean, this guy is dedicated. You know, I mean, we've heard remarks from Greg Schiano. We've heard remarks from James Franklin. Um, yeah, th this is just atrocious. I know USA Today has been all over this story. Um, you know, it's been very, very disturbing to see the way things have gone down for the Wolverines. You know, realistically speaking, there's a lot of teams fighting now for the college football playoffs. Could this be an in-season punishment for the Wolverines? I know stuff is coming out day by day by day, but 
with what Andy said before, I mean, it makes sense to wait until the season's over, no, because Michigan just continues to get the easy way out. Um, there was video evidence electronics prohibited by the NCAA to steal signs and a significant paper trail of it, too. So um, on, on top of it, the illegal technology used in scouting, right? By, you know, stallions and, you know, holding his smartphone up and appeared to film the home team sideline the entire game. You can't do that. Like, that's just something like absurd. Like, this guy went absolutely rogue. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Michigan's looking for their third straight trip to the CFP. Um yeah, I mean, this rule by the NCAA about scouting in opposing stadiums, that's been in place since 1994. That's been in place for a very long time, guys. That's been in place for almost 30 fucking years. Um, not to mention they already illegally recruited during COVID. So when are the punishments going to come down on this Michigan team? Tick-tock, tick-tock, I'm waiting. Self-imposed. Uh, yeah, this the story is just so wild. I almost like wish it had just been kept for next week because i feel like there's gonna be so many more bombshells that come out in the next seven days i mean if you if you come out hot out of the gates day two with a manifesto dropping uh you know things are gonna get spicy uh in, in the upcoming days as well but yeah this this entire thing i don't see how this doesn't end see we're, we're so far through the season I, I think they might might escape a postseason ban this year but if they do it's it, it might they might get a harsher punishment going forward if that makes sense if ncaa you know, decides to, to grace them with the opportunity to play in the playoff this year, you know, assuming they make it. But, uh, yeah, this this is just so wild that this guy is so crazy. I, I almost feel like he chose Navy over Michigan because in his head he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to get my military experience here. It's going to make my spying for Michigan that much better. Uh, he wasn't very good at it because he bought all the tickets in his own name, which is, I mean, that's just spy 101. Use a fake name. Um, but, yeah, 12 of 13 Big Ten schools uh, also bought tickets to Georgia, Bama, uh, Clemson, pretty much anyone that looked like a contender for Michigan. Uh, one of my favorite things about this is <laughs> there was a snapshot. One of the, I believe it was an Ohio State reporter, went back and found a snapshot from the Michigan sideline, uh, and they freeze framed one of the coaches holding a laminated signal sheet. It was not a Michigan signal sheet. Uh, Ohio State staff has basically confirmed that it was their play calls, uh, their signals. So, I mean, this kid's on the sideline, uh, standing next to all the coaches. They've got laminated sheets of Ohio State, their biggest rivals plays. I don't know how they can get away with this. Uh, this guy is definitely crazy. He's, you know, got some screws loose. I think they're going to come down pretty hard here on Michigan. I don't know if I want him to be pulled from the playoff. It's it's a toss-up for me because on the one hand, they are very good, but on the other hand, you know, maybe they wouldn't have been as good if they were, weren't stealing all these plays. So uh, I'm still up in the air, but I, I would not be surprised if they do catch a postseason ban uh, for this one. That will wrap up our first segment and move us into our second Halloween-themed segment, bringing it back. It is House of Horrors. We're going to give you to each of our most most horrifying uh, plays, teams, situations uh, from the season so far. Andy, we'll start with you. Uh, give us your first. My first one is uh, something we talked about on the show last week, uh, but it's so horrifying I had to bring it back up. It's uh, the Miami-Georgia Tech game, the ending. Miami, of course, having that game won. All they needed to do was kneel out, kneel out the clock. They decided to run the ball. Questionable fumble. May have not been a fumble. It was ruled a fumble. 36 seconds left, Georgia Tech, two plays, they score. Uh, at the time of the fumble, Miami, I think, was minus 1,600 on the money line. Um, <laughs> obviously, nobody's going to bet that, but, like, if you bet $10, you would have won 62 cents. Um, so, <laughs> just incredible. Like, that is, like, one of the worst endings, one of the worst ways to lose a game I think I've ever seen. Like, if that happened to Illinois, I like, they there have been a lot of losses where I've wanted to jump off a fucking bridge, but, like, that... That might have actually pushed me over the edge if I was my own team or actually given me the heart attack that I'm going to eventually succumb to um, watching one of the teams that I choose to get so fucking fired up about. Uh, number two is Sam Houston State season. OK, they're 0-7 at the time of this recording. Uh, coincidentally, at the time of this recording, they are playing at UTEP right now. Um, I did see on Twitter at UTEP's uh, equipment department forgot to pack their white uniforms. So we have a color rush matchup, an unintentional color rush matchup. <laughs> um, it's orange versus blue, which I can get behind those colors. But Sam Houston State currently up 21 13 with 1232 it left in the in the third quarter, looking for their first win of the year, first win in FBS in the FBS. This is a team that they've uh, you know back in the 70s uh, when they originally well it was even before that uh, played in the NAIA in 1986. They became a member of the FCS. They actually spent a couple years in Division Two as well. So they've been all over the place. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, they have made the FCS playoffs six times. They won a national championship in the FCS uh, in 2020. They I mean, they played some really good football 
in 13 FCS playoff appearances, they were 24 and 12 um, with, I think, three national championship appearances and one um, one title. They were super uh, competitive in their conference with, fuck, I think it was like five five or six conference titles since like uh, 2000 or something like that. Don't quote me on that. It could be more. <laughs> um, but anyway, really good. They make the transition to the FBS here, and they've been so close to getting a win, and it just has not worked out for them. They're 0-7. Uh, like I said, chance to win tonight uh, at the time of this recording. Uh, but their last four losses, well, not New Mexico State pulled away, but 27-13, 21-16, 35-28 in overtime, uh, 38-7, 13-3, and 14 and nothing. So they have been in the majority, not, okay, I shouldn't say the majority. They've had some really close fucking losses. Their hearts ripped out a couple times. Um, but I don't know. It's their first year in the Conference USA, and I'd like to see every, everybody get a win at least at least once but yeah there that is that has been my horror uh is tuning in and they always put them on like yeah in the middle of the week too because like oh yeah we'll take the primetime game we're conference usa what the fuck else are we gonna do uh i like it those are two pretty horrifying uh situations and results and teams uh you got there for us uh Last tom you're up next guessing. give us your two all right we're gonna mash up no pun intended i know halloween is But um, Arkansas, the Hogs, are the first um, item for me to enter the House of Horrors. I'm rolling with this team because uh, of a couple of reasons in particular. One, they suck, of course. <laughs> I mean, they're 0 6, they're 0 5 in the SEC, 0 and 6 in their last six games. They're on a six game losing streak. They're just 2 and 6 for the year, and KJ Jefferson is still there. This is not Hogs football, guys. Um, the run game is fucking horrendous. They average 2.9 yards per carry. Absolutely awful. And just looking at what Arkansas has moving forward, it is not pretty. I mean, the SEC is very, very difficult, but I never thought I'd be saying this. Arkansas might finish at the bottom of the SEC this year. And I'm talking about both divisions combined. It is bad. Like, they're almost Vanderbilt bad. I mean, that's how bad they are right now. I mean, they lost the freaking Mississippi State 7-3 to last week. And don't come in here and tell me, well, they lost three points of Bama on the road. Uh, well, you know what? A loss is a loss. I don't care how you lose. I mean, they've lost most of their games by – uh, two possessions or less. I mean, they lost to BYU by seven, LSU by three. They lost to A&M by 12. These are unacceptable losses. You can't lose games in the SEC. That's just how it is. They got Missouri coming up. They got Auburn coming up. Hell, FIU, that's not a sleep away game either. If they play that bad, they could possibly lose to them. So, yeah, the Hogs are done. Stick a fork in them. They are stuck in the House of Horrors this season. Uh, next up, probably the most horrifying game for me. Definitely not the most horrifying moment, but the most horrifying game as a call, as um, most horrifying game as a fan, um, is Sam Hartman throwing those three picks against the University of Louisville. Um, only three picks on the season as well. I should mention. I mean, guy was turnoverless until the Louisville game. He got through U.S. Uh, not U.S.C. Ohio State. Duke turnover free. You know, two decent defenses, two good defenses, and then he comes into Louisville and lays an egg. Uh, granted, his receivers are not that great outside of tight end Mitchell Evans. He doesn't have consistent receiver play this year. The offense revolves around Audric Estime and probably the All-American pro tackle in Joe Alt. Outside of that, the offensive line is not as good as it once was. And Hartman was recruited because Notre Dame wanted to push at a national title or a CFP spot. They have two losses through eight games. The season is done. The season is done. Even if Michigan does get a bit, and that eliminates them from the mix of the playoffs, they're still not getting it. I mean, Notre Dame is what? They're still ranked 13th, 14th right now in the country after beating USC. Um, the win against USC doesn't even good uh, two weeks ago when they did it because USC has since lost to Utah, to a Cam rising list Utah team. So realistically speaking, those three picks against Louisville were very frightening to me. It was unexpected. Um, it was horrifying because that marked the end of Notre Dame's season. As a Notre Dame fan, it's definitely sad to see, but... Those are my two moments that are stuck in the spooky house of horrors for me in 2023. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to put you through that with uh, one of your own team's memories there. Uh, but that is what we're here for uh, on Halloween. I will start with uh, my first one here. We're going to rewind it back uh, just about 10 minutes because it is Michigan's coaching staff's uh, incompetence. Uh, basically, the entire staff. Uh, the players playing very well, obviously. This is uh, one of their best eras of play, at least uh, in the modern era from, you know, it, it, personal opinion, but I think this is, in terms of play, one of the best Michigan squads they've had over uh, a several-year span. But the incompetence, uh, all this shady stuff going on on the coaching staff, it's putting them uh, at risk here. Uh, obviously, Harbaugh, uh, first violation, 
beginning of the season. I think Tommy mentioned it earlier, uh, the COVID recruiting. Um, obviously, he tried to say, oh, I was just getting these guys burgers. They showed up to my house unannounced. I think, you know, with the, with the shady as we're seeing that this staff is now, I'm guessing that was not exactly <laughs> how things shook out. Uh, and then obviously he got in trouble because he lied about the scenario to the NCAA. If it was really, you know, that innocent, why lie about it in the first place? Uh, he takes that three-game ban. It's only five weeks later, and now there's another uh, story coming out, which is even a bigger bombshell uh, with the Stallion story that we just talked about above. Uh, just quickly, I'll add two more <laughs> notes that I thought were very fun so far from uh, this whole situation. Uh, looking at photos from last year's games, uh, a reporter uh, found that Connor Stallions uh, was right next to Michigan's D.C. Jesse Minter when Ohio State had the football. And then, of course, when the ball changed hands, where was he? Oh, he was right next to O.C. Sharon Moore uh, when Michigan had the football. That is um, very suspicious to me, I will say, to just be chasing down the exact coach that you need to be next to uh, who's calling plays in that very moment. So, obviously, this kid is just so super shady. Uh, I, I know we love to hate on Michigan, so to me, it's, this whole thing is kind of funny. Um, and then the second one here, uh, Michigan suspended staffer Stallions paid for tickets on both sides of the stadium <laughs> for this past weekend's Penn State-Ohio State game. They went unused once the story broke. Uh, so <laughs> this kid was just fully prepared to get right back in the saddle, uh, hit up this next game, Penn State versus Ohio State. Uh, story breaks, and he's uh, running, tail between his legs. Uh, I'm sure the cover-ups were happening uh, at his house as the story was breaking, papers being shredded. Uh, I'm sure he has a few passports that he's trying to use uh, to leave the country right now. Um, but no, that is my first one. Michigan coaching staff, uh, just absolutely horrific here uh, and putting the team at risk. Second, I have the new first down rules. This, to me, uh, is nightmare fuel. As a fan, you never want to see this. Obviously, they changed the first down rule for those. You should be aware at this point, but if you are not, uh, the clock no longer stops on every first down, just the last two minutes of the game. The idea, what they told us, was it was going to shorten the games, uh, except the games, they're not longer, but they're at the very least the exact same uh, length because they have filled that time now with more commercials. Uh, and then I just have some quotes here that I thought were interesting because the coaches are obviously very uh, not happy with this. They thought you know players and coaches would like it because it would prevent some injuries. Uh, but at the halftime, week one, Chip Kelly uh, against Coastal Carolina, he said, these new rules are crazy. We had four drives in the first half of that game, uh, four total drives between the two teams. I hope you guys are selling a lot of commercials. Uh, and then Kyle Whittingham of Utah said uh, during the Utah-Florida game, that game, there wasn't a lot of snaps. I guess if they're trying to tone that down, they accomplished their objective. It seemed like they made up for it with more commercials. There were commercial breaks every two minutes. I don't know what that's all about. I guess we got to pay the bills here. Uh, yeah, I think this whole thing was about money. Uh, they tried to scare fans about injuries and saving uh, players and all this, but it, this is all about stuffing as many commercials as possible uh, into our games. Uh, and I hate it. Uh, that will move us into our weekly parlay party. Uh, Andy, we'll start with you. No winners across the board for us last week. Uh, hit us with your eventual winner for this week. Uh, yeah, this one's definitely hitting, boys. <laughs> I have one word for you, and that is points. Um, so I picked six games, and I adjusted the total. Um, not all the way down, um, but average of, you know, like I didn't do anything like minus 200 or anything like that. So like 190, 174, 160, 150, shit like that. So first one over 60 and a half in Oklahoma at Kansas. Um, both teams put up points. I'm going to get myself hurt again betting that Oklahoma over because I actually don't think it ended up hitting uh, last week. I was I dude, I gave that pick out at work. I was like, my favorite pick is, is over in the Oklahoma UCF game. They're averaging 500 fucking yards of offense each, 40 points. But anyway, uh, we're going back to it with Oklahoma. Uh, next up, over 47 and a half in Tennessee and Kentucky. Rivalry game. Um, two teams that don't really like each other. Give me some fucking points, baby. Uh, over 59 and a half, Vanderbilt at Old Miss. Um, betting on overs in Vanderbilt games has been automatic so far this year. Uh, and they're playing a, a very high-powered Old Miss offense. Their defense is not good. Uh, give me the over. Um, oh shit, I had it right here and I just clicked out of it. My bad. Sorry. 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 Okay. Here it is. <laughs> um, next up will be the over 54 and a half UNLV at Fresno state. Um, two very good G five teams. Um, and Fresno state's offense has been really fun to watch. I haven't watched a ton of UNLV. Um, but give me the over 54 and a half. And then I have over 44 and a half, uh, Georgia at Florida world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Give me some points. Um, and then finally, the last game there will be Oregon at Utah over 43 and a half. A little worried about that one, if I'm being honest, boys, just because I know how how good um, Utah's defense seems to play when they play Oregon at home. Uh, but I'm hoping for a different result this year. And 43 and a half does not seem like a ridiculous 
amount of points. So I've got a boost on there. FanDuel is doing this like boost builder shit. Um, so depending on the amount of legs, um, you can you get uh, different boosts. So I had six legs. So let me boost it 45%. Um, so $10 to win $204.87. Um, without the boost, it's plus 1412. With the boost, uh, it's plus 2048. So without the boost, it'd be like 10 to win 140. But still, either way, a great payout. I'm hoping... I'm just rooting for points. I hope everybody does well on Saturday. I like it. I like it. All, all overs, hoping for points. Those are some of my favorite ones to go with. I'm just very bad at them, so I haven't been throwing. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tom, hit us with your parlay. All right. So for my parlay, I'm entering the party here. I'm going to go with one. And this week's going with five this week. Um, Oklahoma, Kansas, similar to Andy here, um, except I'm going a little bit higher, 62 and a half, over 62 and a half. Checks on FanDuel at minus 148. Uh, Florida, plus 17 and a half. I expect them to cover. Uh, this game usually is not a blowout, and I think Georgia won't win by any more than 17. That checks in at minus 170 on FanDuel, so they like that a lot as well. Um, yeah, Graham Mertz against um, Carson Beck, quarterback matchup. Graham Mertz, one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the nation in 2023. I know we dogged on him a year or two ago at Wisconsin, but he has proven a lot of people wrong, and he deserves the utmost respect for that, and I think he'll keep them in the game. Utah, plus 6.5, minus 105. I think this is safe. I get it. Bo Nix, Heisman hopefuls coming in. Troy Franklin, star receiver. Jordan James, Bucky Irving, great. Dan Lanning, their star-studded offense. That's what Utah did to USC last week. Utah's very tough to play at home. Will they be, able, will they be able to tolerate the altitude? That's another thing to consider. Um, I know Oregon plays there pretty much every year or every other year, but I don't think the Ducks are able to win this one on a road uh, on the road by more than one touchdown. I think Utah will come within one score, and that checks in at minus 105. That's probably the most risky one yet. Uh, Arizona money line plus 134. I really like Arizona this week to beat Oregon State, mainly because I don't trust Ukulele, and the Arizona offense is – Really, really good. They have receivers that can ball. Jacob Cowing, or Cowing, however you say his last name. Um, he's been really fun to watch this year, and they have some good ballers on defense as well. And then finally, Brian, I think you'll like this last leg. I have UCF winning their first Big 12 game over Virginia. Um, I, I really like this one at minus 178. You came within two points of Oklahoma last week, and I think it's time. Eventually, it has to come, right? I think it comes this week at home against the Mountaineers. Checks in at plus 1798 or 30% boost that I use to get it to plus 2339. $10 for 233.91. So that's my five legged.
I fucking hate all of them. They all suck. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take Oklahoma to win the game. I think they're the better team. Uh, is Jalen Daniels playing or is it, is it more Jason Bean? Uh, I don't know. The uncertainty at quarterback kind of uh, uh, makes me a little bit nervous to take the Jayhawks here. Historically, uh, it makes me a little nervous to take the Jayhawks here um, in this matchup. But no, I know Oklahoma had the scare with UCF. I think they bounce back. Um, I think they, I think they win this game. Um, yeah, I like Oklahoma too here. Um, again, tough one last week against UCF. They lead the all time series 80 to 27 to provide some clarity on what Andy just said. If you pick Kansas, you're a fool. They haven't beaten Oklahoma since 1997. It's been a while. Um, Oklahoma, however, they've won their last two games by a, co- a co- five against Texas and UCF. They're led by a name who has possibly entered the Heisman discussion in Dylan Gabriel. Um, 20. Six total touchdowns this year. 21 passing, five rushing. Uh, Nick Anderson has eight tutties. Drake Stoops has five. Jaleel Farouk is the leading receiver in yards. He has three viable options. Defensively, they're really solid on the back line with Key Lawrence and Billy Bowman Jr. Danny Stutzman anchors the middle. Really good tackling in the middle of the field in in isolation. And I like Ethan Downs to dominate the trenches against that Kansas front for a team that does average 211 rushing yards per game. However, I do think Kansas keeps this close. This is where the discussion really begins. They have two running backs with six touchdowns. I like Devin Neal. Uh, I heard from a source today, Andy. Now, I don't know if this is incredibly accurate, but Jason Bean is expected to start at quarterback this weekend. Uh, so we will see if that happens. Um, if so, I, I don't think it's going to matter too much. I think the Jayhawks' four-game winning streak ends sooner. Yes, uh, for me, I'm going Oklahoma. Uh, as well, Jayhawks, they are coming off a bye week, uh, so they're going to be a little fresh. But, yeah, I don't think we, we trust be- Bean as much here uh, at QB um, to be able to stick with Oklahoma at least till the very end. You said maybe close. It was close last year, 52-42. to 42, uh, But something notable, Kansas has not beaten OU since 1997. Uh, I think I was in, like, what, third, fourth grade at that point. Uh, I don't know, ages and grades uh, when I'm on the spot. But it's been a while, we'll say that. Uh, and this is their last chance because Oklahoma – uh, is hightailing it out of there um, as they change conferences. So maybe Kansas, that, that'll light a fire under them. They'll want to get that one win. Uh, but yeah, the Sooners have won the last 18 matchups between these two sides. Sooners offense, obviously top of the town, fourth in the nation in points per game, seventh uh, in total yards per game, and seventh in yards per game passing. Um, so, I mean, I, I've spoken about Dylan Gabriel. I think all of us have at this point. Uh, someone I know threw him in the Heisman chat last week. I think that was uh, Tom, and I, I agree. Uh, and he's getting help uh, in that uh category because he has four wide receivers uh who are you know just laying their laying their some laying themselves on the line for the ball they've all got over 300 yards uh Jaleel Farouk Drake Stoops Andrell Anthony and Nick Anderson so um I think you need to be a very very good team to cover an offense that can spread the ball that wide uh especially when they're putting up 500 yards for a game I don't think Kansas's defense uh can do that I do like the run game like you said Tom but I don't think it's enough to get them over the line here uh, moving on to the next game, because this is Halloween themed, uh, each time slot here will have one spooky, scary game. This is our first uh, for the new slot. It is scary because this is such a bad matchup here. We have two and five Army taking on one and seven UMass. This might be worse than the Minnesota Iowa matchup we put on the Ooh. card last week. Uh, Andy, yes or no? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's a one and seven team going to play a two and five team. Uh, last time these these guys, these guys matched up, forty four to seven win for the Cadets. Um, they certainly um, were a better team than they were last year. Uh, UMass being led by Clemson transfer Tyson Pomenchow at quarterback. Uh, really fun name to say. I believe Don Brown, the former Michigan man, um, coincidentally the head coach over there. But yeah, give me give me Army here. Uh, I just it's just so tough to scheme and plan for their offense uh, in one week because it's just so unique and you just don't see you don't play a lot of teams that that run, that, run that. Uh, I will say this will be the last time these teams match up as independents army announcing today they're joining the american athletic conference so good for them uh but yeah give me army here they're at home um and i think the triple option gets it done <laughs> all right tom um yeah coming off a of bye week it's it, it's been a struggle for the minute then they lost to penn state 63 to nothing in their last game they might be the worst division one 
FCS school or FBS school, pardon, um, this season. They're bad. They're really, really bad. Karon Lynch Adams is the only source of offense that they have. Anthony Simpson is okay at receiver, but a lot of these yards are coming in garbage time. Let's remember that. Um, when I look at Army, they average 190 rushing yards per game. They're on a five-game losing streak since starting 2-0. You know, Bryson Daly, nine total touchdowns on the year, three rushing. He's a solid QB, and I think Army takes this one. Yeah, I'm going Army as well, uh, but I will throw a few quick stats in here. You guys talk about uh, UMass's embarrassing loss, uh, but they both had embarrassing losses uh, in their last game. Actually, Army losing 62-0 to to LSU, uh, but not to be outdone. UMass said, no, sir, we're going to lose 63-0 to Penn State. So checkmate Army, you're not the worst team uh, in this matchup. But yeah, here, you're getting your classic uh, Army offense here, all run, no pass game. Uh, but if you want to know about their pass game, Bryson Daly has thrown for just 712 yards, com- completing just 54.5% of his passes with a mere six touchdowns and four interceptions. That is good for 101 yards per game through the air. Um, but yeah, they only break that out if they're doing like trick plays. Obviously, the triple option is uh, what you need to watch for. And I feel like once a year we hear a, like a big top 10, top 15 team who has to play this triple option say, oh yeah, you know, we just, how, how do you plan for it? Uh, you know, we took a practice or two and did it. Uh, I don't think that's probably true. They're probably exaggerating a little bit because we do see the triple option uh, take down some teams. And against the one in seven team, I think, you know, it brings you big problems. Uh, and my favorite stat here, and why I'm locking in Army to win by a million, UMass have not won more than one game since 2018. They've already locked in that one win. They're sitting at one and seven. So I think uh, they lose out the season here. This team is cursed, or they're just that bad. Uh, so I'm riding uh, with the Freedom Fighters here, uh, our Army. Um, moving into 330, we have Utah taking on Oregon. Uh, a rank versus rank, highly ranked Pac-12 matchup here. Utah just crushing dreams again for Pac-12 CFP. Can they do it two weeks in a row, Andy? I believe you're on mute. Sorry, dog. Neighbor's dog was barking, so I put myself on mute. But I actually do think they can. Um, They always seem to play Oregon tough. They always seem to beat Oregon when they're at home and when Oregon seems to be the superior team. Um, Utah, they are the 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 Pac-12 always seems to eat itself alive, but Man, if Utah wins this game, they're playing themselves into the conversation. They become the Pac-12 favorites, and, you know, they went out. They would have – I mean, it would be hard not to put them in uh, to the CFB at that point. Um, obviously, it's going to be a tough game. The Oregon offense is averaging 47 points per game uh, and putting up 550 yards. So you you got to show up on defense. Um, and then Bryce Barnes is going to have to pull another game like, like last week out of his ass um, if he's able to do that. Um, so I, I don't know. It's going to be an uphill battle, but – they, they get at least three points for me for the crowd advantage alone. Maybe more than that. Maybe I'm underselling, but um, yeah, I'm going to take Utah to upset Oregon. Yeah, that is, it's one of the toughest places to play. I feel like, I think most of the upsets I picked with them last year uh, was because of that thin Utah air. And just those, you know, the Mormon vibe just enveloping the stadium uh, can get you at any time. Uh, Tom, who are you taking in this game? Yeah. Um, look, this is going to be a tough game to pick and rightfully so, because both teams are really good. Oregon's offense averages 553 yards per game. I mean, Bo Nix has been elite this year, arguably top five Heisman candidate, a sack only four times. His O-line is great. They're coming off an impressive two-touchdown win against Wazoo. Uh, now, their ground game is really, really effective. Job in space. He's awesome to watch. Seven touchdowns on the year, 650 yards. He's their bell cow. Their complimentary back is just as good, Jordan James. Um, I, I like watching him play, too. I think he's very electric and powerful. Averages eight yards per clip and has eight touchdowns. Both of these guys can kill you in short yardage situations. And then Troy Franklin, a guy who hands down will go at worst in the top of the second round of this year's NFL draft. That's how good he is. His stock is continuing to rise. He's a great route runner. He creates separation. He makes catches. He is a red zone threat, eight touchdowns on the year. Uh, and defensively, they got guys like Brandon Dorless, Evan Williams, guys who can get to the quarterback. Now, Oregon leads the series all time 24 to 12, you know, despite all the success Utah has had. You know, Bryson Barnes had three touchdown passes last week. He might have trouble duplicating that defensively. You know, I like Cole Bishop, Lander Barton. Factor here is Jonah Ellis with those 10 sacks. He's one of the best pass rushers in the nation. Logan Fennell's not too bad either with three and a half. This is a very interesting game. And we Utah has proved to America, stop judging them as if they're without Cam Rising. Cam Rising will not play this season, in my opinion. 
Um, I think he's getting a medical red shirt and he's coming back for year number six or seven, whatever the fluff it is at this point. Uh, with that all being said, give me the Utes in an upset. I like it. I like it. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to be straightforward. Like I said, I love picking Utah. They're like my favorite upset team. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, this home stadium, the vibe, I don't know what it is about that place. Like, you don't think a team like Utah, I know um, back in what was like 08 when they were super elite, then they kind of fell off a little bit. Now they're back. The fans are behind them. They're on an 18 game winning streak. Uh, it's just a super tough place to play. Uh, and that's not good for Bo Nix because he, when playing at home, is 23 and 5, but on the road, just 14 and 12. That does include neutral games as well. Um, but, you know, that's not the best look. Obviously, you're going to be uh, a better at home and a lot more comfortable, but just above 500 on the road, that's really rough, and you're going into a really tough uh, Utes environment here. It, it could be problems if he doesn't get clicking early uh, and that Utah defense puts him under pressure. Utah, obviously, their offense is going to be the big question mark here. They're without Cam Rising uh, in this lineup. Since then, 161.7 passing yards per game. It's not terrible, but... I. Th- Everyone in the state of Utah, outside of Utah State fans, wants Cam Rising back uh, under center there because that is last in the Pac-12 as far as passing game goes. Listen, Bryson Barnes, not as good, but he he put everything on the line. That was one of my favorite performances I, I've watched in a while. Uh, that run to set up the field goal, <laughs> just going throwing shoulder first into a tackle uh, to get that, you know, every little last inch. Um, you know, if, if he's not banged up because of stuff like that from last, last week and he's healthy here, I, I think he can put it to get together just another spunky performance. Um, you know, Rudy style here for, for, for the Utes. Uh, Oregon, this is the stat I'm watching. Oregon has not faced a top 100 rushing team in the nation yet. So we talk about how good this Oregon defense is, but a, a lot of these teams they played have been super one-sided, and we already knew going into it that they had one of the best secondaries uh, in the nation. A lot of coaches have talked about it, uh, including wide receiver coaches. So um, if the team can only throw, it's going to make your secondary look a lot better because they have more opportunities uh, to knock those balls down, to show their talent. But we haven't seen from that D-line uh, and those linebackers, if they can stop a, a good run game yet, uh, we will see uh, if they can do that against Utah here. I don't think they do. Uh, and I think Utah, again, takes down a playoff hopeful for the Pac-12. Uh, and we laugh all the way to the bank here. Uh, and that will bring up our 3.30 for uh, the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Of course, it is Florida taking on Georgia in Jacksonville. Uh, I won't call it the party city of Florida, but it's certainly one of the oddest uh, areas in Florida. A very Florida man-like city. Andy, I'll start with you. Who's winning this one? Um, my bad. <laughs> got a got a text from the old lady, so I had to make sure I wasn't in trouble. Um, who's winning this one? Georgia's going to win this game. They're seventeen and a half point favorites. I do think Florida is able to keep it close. Um, and that you know they they kind of hang around because uh, Georgia has seemed to let teams do that so far this year. I like what you said uh, about Carson back earlier. He's kind of uh you know very average, but you know they're not they're used to having kind of average quarterbacks. But, I mean, their offense, it's still really good. They're still averaging 515 total yards uh, per game, over 300 through the air, 170 on the ground, putting up 40 points a game. So it's still going to be tough to stop. Um, but, you know, the Florida defense hasn't looked that bad um, this year. They're only allowing their opponents to convert on third downs 29% of the time and only giving up like 20 points a game. Um, so maybe their defense, you know, steps up and can keep keep, keep them in it. Maybe Graham Mertz, um, you know, make some make some big throws i mean he's gonna have to i should say i don't want to say florida has to be perfect to win this game because i don't think they do um but give me georgia all right tom yeah we've been covering this game all week at work and you know very excited to break this one down florida two straight wins over vanderbilt and south carolina no brock bowers uh, you know, Carson Beck has had a solid year, first full season as a starter, replacing Stetson Bennett. The redshirt junior has over 2,100 yards through the air, 12 touchdown passes to four picks. He's been sacked just five times, and I think what's really benefited him is the running game. Uh, Diwan Edwards and Kendall Milton, those two combined have been very, very good. He relies on them. Edwards more north and south. Milton a little bit more explosive in the backfield. Uh, with Bowers out, who's going to step up in the receiving game? Well, there's two guys. Tight end Oscar Delp has two touchdowns this year. He's developed nicely. He'll be the uh, successor to Brock Bowers once he departs for the NFL. And then Vlad McConkie is back. He missed the first few games with an injury this year. Glad to see him back in the lineup. Those two will complement Marcus Roseme, Jack Saints, and Dominic Lovett very, very nicely. Georgia defensively is tough. I mean, you got Tyke Smith with four picks. He has excellent press man coverage. Good luck trying to get separation from uh, Jamon Dumas Johnson can blitz up the A-gap. He can go sideline to sideline. He can scrape off offensive linemen. He's really, really good. 
Um, yeah, this is going to be tough. You know, Georgia has three ranked games following this one. But there is really one thing to consider here. Graham Mertz. That's why Florida will stick around in this game and have a chance. Because Graham Mertz has only one turnover-worthy play all season long. He has more passing yards than Jordan Travis. And I think it's important to really talk about how well he has played. Um, you know, Montrell Johnson Jr. in the backfield has been solid. Trevor Etienne as well, similar to Georgia. The Gators also have two backs they can rely upon. Uh, Ricky Pearsall, who I mentioned, over 600 receiving yards. Eugene Wilson is really good on curl routes and hitches. And I like Arliss Mortingham over the middle of the field. Definitely an all that's not worth overlooking. But this Florida defense has been what they've been relying on, right? The Gators, that, that defense has been really, really strong. Prince Lee, Uma Lallin, uh, three sacks going up against the Marius Mims. Uh, the matchup I'm looking at, Cam Jackson against Tate Ratledge as well. Those two matchups, Prince Lee versus Marius, and then Cam Jackson versus Tate Ratledge. Who's going to come out on top of those? I think Georgia does. So Georgia wins by about 10 to 14 points. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm torn because I really want to toss a wrench into this here and call for an upset. Because um, if you will remember, I did, as my uh, hottest take for the preseason, say that all of F or LSU, Alabama, and Georgia would not make the college football playoff. Uh, but Georgia is rolling right now, so that's not looking too too good. Um, but yeah, the key here for me uh, in the world's largest outdoor cocktail party is uh, Graham Mertz. I, these are both very average QBs. Like you said, Georgia got away with it. They've gotten away with it two seasons in a row because the rest of the team has been uh, just that phenomenal, that good. Uh, we've seen all those guys going into the draft, getting drafted very highly, um, very highly respected players, and, and they put it all on the field. But I don't think they're as strong as they have been uh, these past two seasons, and we've seen them be, I don't know if it's been about half their games. I'd have to look through their entire schedule. Um, but at least in three of their games, they looked a little shaky. Uh, Graham Mertz on the other side can pull out some stunning performances uh, in his own right, though. Um, Graham Mertz connecting on most of his passes for the last five games. He's thrown for plus 80% completion percentage, uh, or I should say 80% or better, if you want to put it that way, uh, with 10 touchdowns and just one interception in that five-game span. The biggest problem for them is their O-line. The O-line not protecting Mertz. He's been sacked 14 times in those same five games. That's got, Georgia's not sacking players as much as you would think. They've only got 12 so far this season. But, I mean, if Florida's O-line is going to be that suspect, you got to think he's going to be struggling uh, to, to stay in the pocket, uh, to connect on passes when he's being pressured by uh, some absolute mammoths on this Georgia D-line. Um, yeah, Carson Beck, the other side at QB. He's from Jacksonville. I guess that helps a little. little home field advantage for him. Uh, but in a way, in neutral games this season, he's thrown for just two touchdowns and two interceptions. So, again, another uh, QB in this game that is just not putting up stats. You guys mentioned it, Bowers out. You do get McConkie back, but obviously you don't want to lose your leading receiver in Bowers. I think they will struggle to throw the ball here um, against Florida. Like I said, Georgia, uncharacteristically, only 12 sacks uh, through the first you know eight games of the season so far. Uh, but their DBs have been stepping up for him. Tyke Smith in the secondary has four interceptions uh, and two to Malachi Starks. Nothing on paper says Florida should win this game, but I'm crumbling up the paper. I'm tossing it behind me into the fire. Uh, I'm taking Florida here because this just has crazy upset game written all over it for me. Maybe I should have thrown this in my parlay because I'm sure the odds on here for a money line Florida uh, were quite large. But yeah, I I'll, I'll break from the pack here and, and go with uh, the Gators. Moving into 7.30, we have Arizona taking on Oregon State. Oregon State just on the cusp of being a top 10 team here at number 11, taking on Arizona. The Arizona team's have been really taking uh, the top Pac-12 teams uh, to the grindstone so far. Uh, is there an upset written in, in the cards for this one as well, Andy? Oh, well, you picked it. You've been right on these type of games the last two weeks, so I'm going to blindly follow and say, yeah, uh, give me Arizona. Uh, so the big question for me, though, in the game, can they stop the Oregon State rushing attack? We know Oregon State is going to be very methodical. Uh, they like to run the ball a lot. They're averaging 195 yards per game on the ground, but not so fast, my friends. Arizona only allowing 96 rush yards per game. have been very, very good against the run so far this year. Uh, they're going to have to do it again. I'll give them a slight edge because they're at home. That helps a little bit uh, against a ranked team. Um, but, yeah, I will I, I will take Arizona simply because you have them in your parlay, Brian. <laughs> All right, Tom? Yeah, 10.30 start Eastern time, very late. Beavers coming off a win against UCLA. They also beat Utah this year. Their offense runs the ball very well. They average nearly 200 rushing yards per game, but Arizona only allows 96 and a half rushing yards per game. Uh, ukulele is still there. He is still there. 
he, he just continues to get talked about on the show year after year after year. Um, but their offensive dynamic revolves around three guys. Damian Martinez, who is a fantastic rusher. We've talked about him in previous weeks. Silas Bolden, their leading receiver, and tight end Jack Villing. Who the hell gets seven touchdown receptions on 16 catches? There's not many players. Why do I talk about tight ends? Why am I fascinated with them? Because you, you, you can get seven touchdowns on 16 catches. It's not uncommon. You know, tight ends don't catch the ball much. When they do, it's very exciting. Uh, defensively, I like what they got with Easton Mascarenas Arnold. He's a solid player. Akili Arnold as well. John McCarradin. But when I'm looking at Arizona, they just beat Wazoo 44-6. to They took USC to triple overtime. They came within seven points of Washington. They won't reveal their starting quarterback until just before the start of the game. Will it be Jaden Delore? Who the hell knows? I don't. Uh, Territorial McKillen, Mc- McMillan, fantastic receiver. Jacob Cohen, a definitely NFL draft pick this year with eight touchdown receptions. And I like what they got off the edge. Taylor Upshaw um, might cause some havoc along that Beavers offensive line. Give me Arizona as well. Yeah, I- I'm all over Arizona here for, for the sweep. We talk about Oregon uh, a few times. Everyone knows how we feel about DJ uh, Uyunga the way. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know what's in the water in Arizona, but they're just putting together some incredible performances against uh, these top teams in the Pac-12. And I really think, I mean, we were high on the Pac-12 uh, these last couple of weeks about their playoff shots, but uh, the state of Arizona might just, you know, shoot them all dead. It's like uh, fishing in a barrel for them. They're just taking down these teams or at least taking them down to the wire here. Uh, yeah, Arizona's defense gave up a TD in the first five minutes of the game against Wazoo. You say, uh-oh, Pac-12 giving up a TD that early. It's going to be an absolute shootout. But they then went on to hold Wazoo to zero points for the next 54 minutes and 59 seconds. You don't see that very often, even in Iowa games, uh, let alone uh, Pac-12 offensive uh, games here. I know DJ's, you know, not the gunslinger uh, that we have with, you know, the rest of our Pac-12 QBs, but that is very impressive for a Pac-12 defense. Um, and yeah, they replaced Jake Delora with Noah Fafita. He went 34 for 43 with 342 yards. To me, and, you know, I may have cheated here and looked at a few Arizona uh, tweets and message boards here. They don't really like Delora that much. So I think if you keep Noah Fafita in here, uh, you can win the game pretty handily. Um, well, I say handily. Oregon State's defense is, you know, good enough to not make it a blowout. But uh, I think they could pull off a double-digit win here uh, over number 11-ranked Oregon State. And that run defense, I'm absolutely loving it. Force DJ to throw. I don't think he can. I'm taking Arizona here as well. Then moving into our scary game uh, for the night slot, we have Fresno State taking on UNLV. This one, a scary one, but in a good way. It is a scary good turnaround for this UNLV program that has been historically bad uh, over the past decade. They are now crushing it. Andy, can they beat uh, Fresno State here? And my ex-QB from UCF. Uh, man, this is going to be a really, really good game uh, in, in the Mountain West. So you got two high-powered offenses, both going over 400 yards a game. They're both putting up 35 points a game. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of this, and they're both converting 50% of their third downs. Could be a long night for these defenses. Uh, I will give Fresno State the slight edge here, being the home team. Um, but UNLV, man, uh, I think up until last week, they've covered the spread every week. So I will take... Uh, Fresno State, I think this one's going to be really close. This could come down to whoever has the ball last. Yeah, it does have a shootout potential written all over it. Tom, uh, who wins this game? Well, let's consider, too, UNLV, 3-0 in the Mountain West. They're in second place right now. They score a lot of points. They've scored 40-plus in four of their last five games. They run the ball efficiently. Three guys have over 300 yards. I mean, Donovan Lester with seven touchdowns. Jaden Thomas also with seven. Ricky White solid in the receiving game. They cause a lot of turnovers. And they're going up against the quarterback who has mightily improved since his time at UCF in Mikey Keene. He led the way against Utah State last week for the Bulldogs, and he's looked good. He's limited his turnovers this year. Malik Sherrod and Elijah Gilliam. Um, I, I like their Z receiver a lot in uh, Eric Brooks. I think he's a real good player, a lot of potential, could possibly make the NFL one day. And Carlton Johnson, know where he is on the field. He's a menace, four picks on the season. I like Fresno State here more because of the home field advantage. So give me the Bulldogs. Yeah, I I really want to go with UNLV here. It's a team that hasn't gotten many wins uh, in the past. Uh, anyone that's followed, I, for some reason, that entire area over there uh, in like the Las Vegas, New Mexico area, those teams are not historically very good. Uh, this, I think they won like four games in three seasons. They had a little bit of a better season. Uh, last year, they had five uh, wins. 
but it's a lot of the same uh, returning players here, and they have improved. Uh, it just shows you that NIL doesn't always have to uh, play a big part here. They've stuck it out with UNLV, uh, and they look really good uh, doing it because they are 6-1 and one already. Um, but the player who has not stuck around because he is brand new uh, is UNLV's quarterback, uh, Jaden Maiava. Sure, I butchered that. He is a true freshman. Uh, he doesn't quite have the TDs yet, uh, but he's making very good passes. He's, he's got the yards only uh, or over 1,300, not quite as, ma as many as Mikey Keene here. But, you know, Mikey Keene has the experience. He played on an offense uh, that played a mile a minute here at UCF. So, you know, you don't expect him to be putting up those numbers yet through seven games of his college career. Yeah, th these teams, they're just so similar right now. Both over 400 yards of offense. Uh, UNLV's defense, though, is a little suspect here. So i got to give the edge to Fresno State. I do want to see UNLV continue to do good. Uh, they are advancing as a program, but I, I don't think they can edge Fresno State here. So I'll stick with my, my boy Mikey Keene. And that will wrap up our Shots and Chasers wrap up our Halloween special. Hope it was uh, some good action and a little spooky for you. Down in the description, we have some spooky links as well. We got Andy's to my left. He's down there. That's the brew party. Follow him. Buy that merch. Bet everything his dog brew does, uh, and you'll make yourself some money. To my right, Mr. Scavetta's links as well for review and preview. Uh, and a little NFL action if you're a Giants fan uh, with Big Blue Avenue. That will wrap up our show. Enjoy the Week 9 action. Enjoy your Halloween weekend. And we'll see everybody next week for Week 10.